Thank you for joining iMead. Hello, everybody, and I'd like, um, I hope uh, this meeting is now being recorded. Hello, everybody, and I would like to um, thank you for the opportunity to present at the ABIP webinar. Um, this is an exciting opportunity. It's about a topic that's um, very interesting to me. Can you pull up my slide? We're going to talk about two between endoluminal ablative therapies. Um, it's, an in, it's an exciting topic. Um, first off, of course, my disclosures. I'm a medical consultant to several different companies. I've been an opinion leader to other technologies. I've worked in development of some of these. I don't believe any of um, my current work has any indications or any um, issues with what I'll be saying to you today. I want to kind of break down of techniques into mechanical, thermal, delayed effect, and then introduce um, a couple additional techniques, but really emphasize to you multimodality approach to complex airway problems. The first thing I always like to begin these talks with is the world that we live in. We all look at the human lung. There's 22 to 24 generations of airways. I usually use 24 as a rule of thumb with greater than 100,000 bronchi. That's about 1,500 miles of airways if we go all the way down to the respiratory bronchioles and to the alveolar ducts. Three to 500 million alveoli with an average diameter of 0.3 millimeters. The surface area of the alveoli, if we were to lay them out, is about 70 square meters or the size of a tennis court. And capillaries end to end is 616 miles. So if we take this um, very difficult environment, because it includes both air, solid, and liquid, and we um, wrap it all together, place it inside of our chest, we now have the human lung. The air, the portion of the airway where we work, can you hear me? Can somebody text me to say that you can hear me okay? Yes. I see no. Uh, yes, we can hear you. Yes, we can okay. hear you. I have somebody is um, texting no sound. Um, so we, the bottom uh, line comes to this: we have to rem, um, we have it's the still no sound. I, I will fix it. I'm texting him back. All right. Should I wait or continue? No, gotta continue. There's a lot of people sending no sound. Just uh, just one. Oh, just so one. If oh. anybody. Russ, let me mute and mute the room again then if you'd like. Okay. All right, so I'm um, ready to go. All guests have been muted. <laughs> have been unmuted. All guests have been muted. Okay, let's give that a try. Um, let me give one second to unmute Russ and Dr. Simoff. Okay, um, we're going to continue up, continue on. Um, and the other point that I like to make all is you have to remember that you are working outside of the body when you work inside of the airway. So it's a different environment than what a surgeon might think. I put up this slide only because it helps demonstrate to us all the various tools that we have available to us in interventional pulmonology. When I initially created this slide, and we'll just go with a long time ago, because it was about 20 years ago, um, there were only about six or seven. This slide is behind it now. I think new technologies have to add. We're going to focus in on ablative therapies. Um, why? Because uh, it's palliation of patient symptoms. That's what we always used to th um, think about. It's just the palliative effects. We stop um, dyspnea, we stop hemoptysis, cough, obstructive pneumonia. But that's really um, come to change, I believe. I think that by um, aggressive treatment patients, particularly those who have airways disease, that we can improve their functional status to undergo radiation, chemo, and surgery. We've actually, in our institution, if there's more than a 50% airway obstruction, we aggressively open those airways because we know with radiation, the airways will get smaller still than the 50%, and that 50 is kind of the cut line where people begin having dyspnea. By being aggressive um, treatment on the front end, 
We find our patients tolerate treatment much better, and I think that it's a very important component to what can be done with ablative therapies. And lastly, there's cure. There's superficial cancers and benign tumors, which we can um, use, as well as in benign disease, for instance, in tracheal stenosis. Um, I'll talk about that in just a moment. We have quite a few slides, so I'm going to keep moving. We have to remember that um, we can use it both in malignant and benign, can, um, in benign conditions. When we talk malignant airways disease, we talk, um, this is the largest um, portion that most people will see, but endobronchial airway obstruction, extrinsic compression, mixed compression, PE fistulas, massive homostasis, metastatic disease, and then carcinoma in situ and then non-invasive disease. Those are the types of things that we can think about for treatment. Airway obstruction comes in lots of different flavors, intrinsic, extrinsic, and mixed. It's really for the ablative therapies that we're talking about. It's intrinsic and mixed disease on um, which we can use these tools um, to their greatest effect. So when we talk about their um, therapeutic techniques, there are two different types, really. There are thermal, which are laser, um, neomidium YAG, KTP, holmium laser are probably the most common right now. There's electrocautery and electrocautery techniques, as well as argon plasma coagulation. There are also delayed effect treatments. Cryotherapy, brachytherapy, and photodynamic therapy will fit into that category. So we're going to kind of break it down by that. Um, the therapeutic techniques of mechanical versus, um, of course, endobronchial prosthesis. So mechanical is another one of those techniques that can be used. And um, throwing in a few others, there's balloon dilatation, fiber and glue. We use alloderm patch for, um, for airway um, reanastomosis, cyanoacrylate glues in the bronchial valves, et cetera. Let's start with ablative. Um, we're going to jump into rigid bronchoscopy. I, again, there are many slides in this, so I will be going through the slides rather quickly, not touching on every point, but I added quite a few slides with um, references and studies for your review later, should there be anything you want to go back to. But the rigid um, really start with Killian, and it was in the late 1800s. You can see he started in cadavers because people said that nobody could do this. He was actually kicked out of his um, international society at that time when he first began doing rigid bronchoscopy and pulling foreign bodies from airways. That's really what he got known for. Rigid bronchoscopy, you can see Shigeto Akita was using rigid before he developed the um, um, Mashita scope and then eventually became the flexible bronchoscope. That's his fellow, and yes, that's a chair he developed just for doing rigid bronchs. But really, this number from 1991, there were only 8% of pulmonologists who used um, rigid bronchoscopy. That number has begun to grow, but actually it's never been restudied as to what, um, the, where we actually stand with this. To do rigid bronch, you need a bigger team. You have to have anesthesiologists, you have to have nurses, and you have to have assistants who really know what you're doing. With rigid, one of the tools that um, make it very effective or removing tissue from an airway very, very quickly is um, the apple coring technique. Um, of course, you have to be just as careful because you can go through an airway wall, you can stare at the aorta. Yes, I have stared at the aorta before. Um, and people do live still, but um, you are dealing with a malignant disease that isn't ever going to be just endobronchial. Um, there will always be some airway wall involvement. You have to know your anatomy very well. You have to have good angles of approach, and you have to be extremely comfortable with using the tool. Go ahead. What you'll see next is a brief um, is a brief video of apple coring. I think it's important to, when we talk ablative because mechanical tools are in a, um, in a way an ablative technique. You'll see a right main stem tumor. That main stem, um, what we use is the bevel of the um, rigid bronchoscope. You can see us placing the location where the tumor is. We move it back and forth several times, applying pressure, leading down. But again, you have to be comfortable with your anatomy. You can often see it break loose. You need to maintain pressure from wherever you cut it because obviously there will be some bleeding from that. Can you switch me back? Next, um, after we've cut it out, there are mechanical debulking techniques. Mechanical, de um, mechanical debulking can be used with, um, with, force, um, with forceps or the rigid. You can remove large pieces of tumor. This just shows some rigid for on um, the rigid forceps 
versus um, flexible forceps. If you're going to debulk, flexible forceps really do very well for you. The next video is just following up um, with using the rigid forceps for a debulking, where we can go down and we can grab very large pieces of tumor and pull them up through the rigid bronchoscope. This is an abbreviated video. And it will come up. Another ablative, another ablative technique using more mechanical tools is that of micro debris or micro debris. It's not a common tool, but it's, a, it's an excellent tool. Um, actually, if we look at it, let me go to the next slide, you can see the blade here. Um, the blade has both suction and an oscillating blade in it. It rotates, we usually set it about 1200 RPM. And um, as this video will demonstrate to you, the suction, um, the suction component will actually pull the tumor into the device where the oscillating blade will cut it. The tissue is then suctioned into the um, into the scope. One of our favorite ways of using the, um, this tool is for endobronchial papillomatosis. It works outstanding. It doesn't cause any um, it doesn't cause any aerosoliz uh, aerosolization because everything is suctioned up immediately. Small endobronchial tumors will um, can come off of the wall just as quickly and just as easily. It's rotated through. You obviously have to be cautious with this, like anything else, because the airway wall is not that thick. And if you keep pushing the oscillating blade up, it will, um, it will cut through the wall just as easily. We can move on. Now we're going to get to one of my favorite, laser. I have a lot of slides on laser because I think that it's really been the tool that's um, historically been used for an extended period of time in this, um, in this arena. Um, it all started with Albert Einstein with his, um, with his theories, and then we moved along into 1957 um, with Gordon Gould, then um, Theodore Maiman, and finally um, Lafort in 1976 use this in an airway tumor for the first time. There are two predominant effects which can be used for a laser. You can use photocoagulation or photodesiccation. Photocoagulation is a precursor to mechanical debulking also. We use the laser to heat up the tissue deeply so that we can um, diminish the vascularity to it. That doesn't mean making it black. It actually means making the tumor look pale. If you make the tumor look pale, um, actually what you've done is you've devascularized it. When we do a black, we're causing necrosis destruction. And that is what truly photodesiccation is. If there's residual tumor, we can burn down, we can burn down that tumor. We can actually burn down into the submucosal layers of the airway wall to get, um, to get both regular tumor, but for instance, in carcinoid, et cetera. Um, again, I'm going to move quickly, but basically an external energy source is excites the electrons. We take that to a higher level. Once that, ele um, once that higher level falls back on um, it starts releasing radiation in the form of photons. Um, white light is obviously polychromatic. We have scattering in all directions. Where laser light is um, monochromatic, it's collimated, which means the wavelengths are parallel to each other and it's coherent, so it's unidirectional. Now, it's kind of interesting, though, because when we look at all of these theories, we think, aha, the laser light is going pinpoint straight. But even if you use a laser pointer on a wall, and try this one time, if you point it, if you're only a foot away from the wall, point it to the wall and you'll see the, um, you'll see the beam. Then move away about five to six feet. That way on um, the light actually diminishes ever so slightly because it dissipates wide. So although laser is collimated and it's supposed to be parallel, um, it's actually going to have some spread to it, even at the distance of a one to two centimeters. Um, the energy source um, and the median is really what dictates the characteristics of the laser. Um, there's a lot of different kinds, argon, CO2, neomidium, yttrium, aluminum, garnet, homium, or diode lasers. Um, depending on the wavelength and the other characteristics of the laser, you can use it in a variety of different ways. We choose the laser, to, we choose the active median based on the, to, um, the way that we want to tr um, treat things. Neomidium YAG, for instance, is 1,064 nanometers, but you can see a CO2 laser, which is commonly used by our ENT colleagues, is over 10,000 um, nanometers. 
The holmium and the KPP are much lower, but the, um, the characteristics of the holmium can be modified so that it can act more like a neumidium yag. Much of the original literature was done on the neumidium um, using the neumidium yag, and it does have the deepest optical penetration. You have to remember, if you hold the laser and keep pointing it at the same spot, it will dig a hole, it will cut a hole, and it will keep right on going um, as that energy is absorbed, if you give it enough energy. This slide came a little bit, um, looks a little bit wobbly, but it just goes over the common comparison of some of the um, different laser types. Um, thermal, um, some of the thermal effects on tissue we have to remember. At 60 to 65 degrees, we have denaturization of protein. If any of you are involved in bronchial thermoplasty, you'll know that number because we, um, we actually use that in our treatment. We can get photoablative effects once we're above, um, greater than 100 degrees Celsius. True carbonization at 200 to 400 and vaporization and ablation is greater than 400 degrees Celsius. So you're really getting this tissue cooked when, you saw you, when you're using it for tissue um, a removal. So it's truly a thermal energy and a high level thermal energy. A laser system mechanical debulking, how do they work together? Well, quite often a laser can be used for photocoagulation. You can see that in these images um, that the tumor as the tumor zone that we treated is actually pale. Once it's pale, um, we can use either rigid debulking techniques, we can use apple coring, whatever is necessary, and then remove the tumor. But the goal when you're going to use a com um, combined treatment modality is that you really want that paling effect for the devascularization and obviously doing exactly what you want to do is to, de uh, is to minimize bleeding. So where are favorable lesions for the laser? Obviously trache um, uh, central lesions are more tracheal, main bronchi, BI. Um, now the low bar bronchi, can you um, do it? Yes, you can. We are actually just um, did a laser resection in the left upper lobe. We've actually done quite a few of those in the um, in the last um, about three four months. We've been joking that um, that's just like all we see are left main stem and left upper lobe tumors anymore. Um, the bottom line is that wherever you can direct the tool safely, you can use it. Um, the more comfortable you are with the tool, obviously, the better off you're going to be using it. Um, unfavorable lesions, airway obstruction from external compression. You can't use this for external compression. Total obstruction in the airway, there's a questionable area. Um, are you devascularizing it? And it becomes um, how confident you are with the rigid and other um, processes. Submucosal infiltration is actually very interesting. Depending how deep it is, you can use the laser to cause um, destruction of the, uh, of the submucosa. And we do it quite commonly, particularly in um, carcinoid tumors and others that extend along those lines. And then chronic collapse. This is an interesting problem. Um, it says um, all the literature talks about greater than six to eight weeks. Um, if an airway is closed for greater than six to eight weeks, you shouldn't be trying to open it. And um, I dispute that um, in terms of having 22 years doing this, that when we open airways that have been closed much longer than six to eight weeks, um, and I can tell you that after even one to two weeks in certain instances, when you try to open it, the lung won't re-expand. You have to look at all the physiologic characteristics of the patient and the situation to make the determinations which you believe are important. And if you have questions, find somebody to talk to who has some experience. The next couple slides are basically um, just a couple studies I threw, um, I threw in. They're talking about safety, et cetera. And um, if you want to review, the slides are available to you, as are the, ref um, as are the references. Basically, lasers are effective in palliation of symptoms. And like I told you before, um, earlier, I believe the palliation of symptoms is as important as in end-stage disease as it is in the beginning of treatment. So can we change mortality and morbidity by using laser? Well, there is suggestion that um, we can actually improve the spy, um, spirometry, thereby improve their mechanical um, mechanics of breathing. We can diminish dyspnea and hemoptysis, as has been said, um, stated before. And is the, um, can it be palliative? Yes, patients will tell you, yes, it can be palliative. Um, in a couple of the big studies, they talk about the most common areas that they've used laser for resection. Um, and we can see the trachea being by far the most common, right main stem, left main stem uh, also. And if we, um, those are two older studies back in the 80s because um, not a lot of these are being really published now. We have um, improved survival. Eichenhorn um, published this in 86. Yes, no difference in survival was published in 88 and 95 again. 
I would like to refer, though, back to this old study by Brunt and Nell that I think really kind of sums things up. Um, here, basically, the control group was those that had, um, had airways to airway tumors, but they did not have laser or any type of resection. They're only getting chemo and radiation. Now, this is back in 87, so it was a pretty standard, um, pretty standard approach to chemo and radiation. But we can see the four-month mortality was 76%, and at seven months, it was 100% mortality in that population. But when all they did was resect the tumor from the airways, we can see that the mortality at seven months was only 40% compared to the 100% that they didn't. This kind of emphasizes the point I made earlier that if we treat airways um, if we treat the airways aggressively, um, that patients have the greater potential for treatment. And let's face it, treatment is much more aggressive now than it was back in the 1980s, and we have um, many more tools available to us. I only put one tool because um, I one slide here. I'm talking about tracheal um, about tracheal stenosis. We can use um, a laser for tracheal stenosis. You can't forget that. Um, to make in, um, to make incisions, and for time's sake, I think we'll skip the video on the tracheal stenosis and just move over to the next um, in next the next set. So are there complications? Of course, there are complications. Um, you have to be care. Um, you have to be careful. And um, that comes with any tool. You have to know where your air. Um, you have to know where your anatomy is in your airway. Um, if you're pointing the laser directly at the aorta, the risk for a lot more bleeding is very high. Um, if you are using rigid inappropriately, using it at poor angles, you can go ahead and make holes in the airways. You can create fistulas in the mediastinum. You can create fistulas into the esophagus. You can create fistulas into um, the superior vena cava aorta or pulmonary artery. So there are a lot of potential risks. Complications, um, hypoxemia. Well, you're going to have low saturations if you're using thermal energy. We're talking about sick patients. We're not talking about well patients. Um, you have to have the FiO2 less than 40% really to be able to perform these procedures um, safely on patients um, without the risk of an explosion and or a fire. And to do that, you have to accept lower SAT. So your anesthesiologist is not going to be happy um, during your procedure. I have a sign that clearly says oxygen is overrated. And um, that is one of the common things, one of the first things my fellows have to um, learn when they're going to be working with us because we expect um, um, that the saturations are going to be low and we have to accept them. So what's low is 80 low? No, not really. A 70 low? That's getting 60. Yes, 50s, we see it not uncommonly. Actually, the lowest SAT I've ever seen in a patient was um, it was measured at less than 10% um, during a massive bleed, and we controlled the airway and were able to wake the patient up, and yes, he was communicating without any signs of brain damage. So it's kind of one of those things that we talk about it a lot. We take our experience from critical care, but we're really not dealing with critical care. We're not dealing with a code. Um, in the same sense when we're dealing with airway on um, airway obstruction. I'm not saying to let your patients have saturations of 10%, don't get me wrong, but we have to um, begin to develop comfort levels um, for, and with the understanding of what it is we're doing. Um, where, what is your comfort level? Because that's gonna be important in you determining what it is that you can and or cannot do. The idea of air embolism comes in in several different um, techniques that, we're, um, that we've been talking about, and those include um, the APC, anything that is blowing air down. Obviously, airway fires um, is one of the greatest risks that we face. Can you go ahead and play that for me? This is just a short video. Hopefully it'll be playing. I don't see it. But for those of you who don't use laser or have never seen one, um, it does show the, um, it shows the laser um, being used. Should be buffering now for many of you. Um, we have suction in, we have suction in the airway. We're always suctioning off secretions. And most importantly, we're suctioning off the smoke, which is created um, with the laser, causing the photocoagulant effects. And particularly if you're causing, um, using it for photodesiccation, even more smoke is generated. But you can see how we can cause the surface to be photodesiccated. Wait 
for my slides. And we're going to move on electric cautery. Electric cautery is actually, um, is actually um, very commonly used throughout Europe and many places around the country. Um, Hooper, Jackson, high frequency electrical currents, we can go on, but we're running out of time. Basically, it's tissue resistance. It's the, as electricity passes through the tissue, the resistance allows the tissue to heat up and obviously cause cautery. Um, we can get coagulation, cutting, vaporization, um, with that. It's much cheaper um, for electric cautery system, and there's many reusable app um, applicators. So those applicators can be hot forceps, cautery tip, wire snare, or electrosurgical um, scalpel. Um, I will tell you the electrosurgical scalpel is probably one of the most dangerous tools in our armament. You can cut through an airway wall without blinking um, with that tool. It is very effective and should be used um, with caution. Um, Indications similarly, endobronchial tumors, um, polypoid, granulation tissue, tracheal, and, and can be used in tracheal stenosis also. Again, um, these are studies that are trying to do comparisons. Um, the electric cautery successfully alleviated. Sorry, there's a uh, slight audio issues. Please give us one moment. Oh, somebody said, "Yep, I'm back." All right, so I'm gonna. Um, the video is going to be coming up, and um, this video is an example of electric cautery. Um, we. Did this one through a rigid. You can see the snare coming out. Um, this is a polypoid um, hammer toma that we resected from the airway. We have to move things around. The goal is to get that snare wrapped around the um, wrapped around the um, polypoid lesion, so you can get as close to the base. Now, the mistake people make is think that you always have to get it out in one piece every single time, and that just isn't true. Sometimes you have to remove things in um, parts. Um, it's more. It can be much more effective. Um, with the electric cautery here, we got it along the base. We usually use a blend of coag and cut when we use electric cautery. And then you can see that we'll just reach in. If you look really quick, you'll see our operating room. There, there it was. And move down back into the airway and we can resect things in one piece. I believe that the, um, the blend works really well for most of the tumors that you're going to be removing. It gives the coagulative effect, especially but when you um, press and use cut to get through the lesion. We can go ahead to the next. Argon plasma coagulation. Uh, now, people say that um, argon plasma is um, the same as laser. It's not. Um, and I want to highlight a couple of reasons that argon plasma is an excellent tool. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. It's a non-contact form of electric cautery. Basically, um, we're taking argon, oops, we're taking argon gas and making it into a pla um, and making it to a plasma by adding ionization to it. So that gas carries. Um, and elect and can carry an electrical charge. It can be used for um, desiccation, coagulation, and devitalization, but not great at destruction. The thing you have to remember about argon plasma is that it hits the surface with electrical energy. It causes coagulation, and when it causes coagulation, the electrical energy no longer goes through. Now, if you use a higher electrical charge, if you use up to 40 watts at the higher um, at the higher end of APC, you can get depths 
the penetration of, you know, several millimeters, four millimeters sometimes, but then you create a, um, you create an eschar and through the eschar, you will not get further, um, to, you will get not, excuse me, you will not get further um, burn. So you have to remember that it's a very surface oriented um, treatment. If you have a big tumor in the airway, you're not gonna get deep into that tumor to cause photo, um, photocoagulation. You will get the surface of it. So if you go ahead with um, large forceps and then try and respect that, there will be the high potential of a lot of bleeding tissue right below it. Excellent tool. You just need to know what the um, limitations are. One of the good things for hemoptysis um, is with hemoptysis, you can paint the surface of a large oozing area. Remember, any thermal energy, you need to get the blood out of the way first. If you don't get the blood out of the way first, the thermal energy will just cook the blood. It will boil and it will create an eschar above what you're trying to um, treat and really won't be very effective. Um, the, one of the neat tricks with APC is because of the flow-based dynamics of it, you can um, use it to get around corners by creating turbulent flow and ang um, with angles of approach. Um, what are the um, risks? The risks are about the same. Airway fire, gas embolism are the big things. You can get airway perforation, but it's much lower, I believe, than um, with a laser. Gas embolization, we talk about it a lot. You have to be cautious. You have to know that it can occur. Um, I have been fortunate in my career and not had an issue with this, but it's been demonstrated conclusively that it occurs using TEE during the use of that. Keep away, um, keep a decent distance from the tissue. Don't go into blind corners where you can force and increase the airway pressure um, locally that will increase the propensity towards um, the development of that technique. And if we can get the quick video. Similarly, I'm going to, um, similarly, you're going to see um, in the airway, using it for painting of the surface. Again, it works quite well for painting the surface of a tumor. It just doesn't give you as deep penetration as does laser. Not showing up yet. And we're back. Um, I'm sorry it didn't play for me, so I don't know how many of you um, actually saw it. Um, thermal energy cautions, appropriate eye protection. If you're using a laser, everybody has to have laser goggles on. The patient's eyes need to be protected. Even though the tool is only in the airway, a laser fiber can have a small break and could place risk. There's absolutely no reason that you should do take that. For any thermal energy, the FiO2 needs to be less than 40%. That's just a rule that you should not break. Um, and make sure that you document that in your notes, because if there is anything that goes on, you have to have it clearly documented that you were less than 40%. Equipment ignition. If a fire starts, it's not just a fire in the airway. Everything you have in the airway will begin to burn, particularly a flexible bronchoscope. It makes a wonderful torch. Get anything out, um, suction catheters, et cetera, as quick as possible. And I mean as quick as you possibly can remove it. Airway rupture, pneumothorax, TEFs, and um, aortic and or pulmonary artery perforations obviously can occur with any of the thermal energies. Ablative techniques in terms of delayed effects are cryotherapy, brachytherapy, and photodynamics. We're running a little bit on time, but I am going to um, hit a couple um, points. You have to remember, the tissue destruction happens at about minus 20 to minus 40 degrees Celsius. Um, and the liquid nitrogen used in most of the cryotherapy units that people will have is about minus 196 degrees Celsius, so more than adequate. The probe will cause a one centimeter radius of destruction. Cryonecrosis, though, occurs over 48 to 72 hours. So it's not, an ex it's not a great tool for going in there and debulking something immediately. You use it to devascularize and um, use it to devascularize an area, and then um, go ahead and um, come back a couple days later to really get the major effects from the vasoconstriction, the platelet plug formation. And then when you resect things at that point in time, you'll have hardly any bleeding. The, the problem comes in is that delayed timing. Most of us, when we go in to remove them of something, it's the immediacy of it. It's probably our impatience more than it is the, um, the necessity for some patients. But the bottom line comes in is the way that we practice this has a certain limitation. There's a contact mode. You um, can actually touch the surface or you can actually take the probe and you can push it right inside to um, inside of a tumor. Usually we use three 30-second freeze-thaw cycles. 
and um, with one centimeter radius. And then once you've treated that radius, you will have an overlap. I believe those overlaps really come into, um, come into play for the, um, uh, and will maximize the effectiveness and the photo and the eventual um, tissue destruction. Cryotherapy, what's the advantages? There's no FiO2 limitations. If you have to have somebody at 100%, you can use cryotherapy. Um, if you need to use it for acute dyspnea, though, again, you have limitations. You can try and freeze it, thaw it, freeze it, thaw it, freeze it, thaw it, and you will get some devascularization, but not nearly what you would get if you were to use thermal tool at that time. It really takes um, the changes that occur at a microscopic and, um, level um, and occur in the capillary due to that injury pattern over 48 to 72 hours to get that maximum effect. What else can you use cryotherapy for? You can remove foreign bodies, um, organic materials, food, some pills, um, but nothing that's for metal teeth. Um, we remove mucus plugs with it, so we, come, um, we create mu uh, mucusicles and clotsicles, um, which can be very, very handy um, way to take something out that really doesn't want to leave otherwise. Photodynamic therapy um, is something we don't talk about a lot, but it's an excellent, um, it's an excellent ablative technology. We don't use it for large tissue at our institution. We use this more for um, a supplemental tool. Um, if we have resected something big and we have residual tumors that we believe um, we can get a maximum effectiveness for, um, PDT is a great tool for that. Um, basically, um, we inject a photosensitizer and I'm sorry, I wanted to show you a different slide. Here it is. We inject a photosensitizer, and about 24 to 36 hours later, we use the o on, we use an OR for application of the appropriate energy. Now, dosimetry is really, really important in this. You have to understand the dosimetry to know exactly how much laser energy based upon what you want to do. Um, once we do the lasers, about 48 hours later, you get the desiccative effect. So we'll basically inject people on Monday, take them to the OR on Wednesday, and bring them back to the Bronx Suite on Friday um, to remove the tissue. If we believe um, once we remove the necrotic tissue that there's some residual tumor, you can do a secondary laser treatment and have the patients come back. Um, Brachytherapy is another, um, is another tool in our armament that we always have to think about. Um, High-dose brachytherapy is the, most com is the most common tool right now. Um, you get a one centimeter variant. It's usually used. Um, beads are placed by the bronchoscopist, but you have to work very closely with your radiation oncology team so that you have great communication. Our radiation oncologists actually come up to the Bronx suite with us, so we sit down and we take a look at the endobronchial disease, the extension, and um, exactly have the plan set on which beads are um, we're going to use as the designated locations for the um, brachy treatment. If somebody's had um, radiation before, we can do two treatments, usually with one week in, be um, in between, but if they've never received radiation to a location, three to four fractions um, is of Available. You can see here on the image where you can see the beads very clearly. Um, it's used for both intrinsic and extrinsic disease. Um, it has been used for the palliation of homopsis cough and even dyspnea. Um, the problem, though, is that the radiation dose can be very, very high. And if you're in a location close to particularly the left pulmonary artery, you have the higher tendency, and or the esophagus, um, you're at risk for um, destroying um, the wall and causing fistula, um, causing fistulas um, and massive hemoptysis. This is one of those big risks. I believe for carcinoma in situ, it's an outstanding tool, as um, is photodynamic therapy, which we move through quickly also. Um, I'm not going to go through the technique, but it is available for you. And can you go home? Oh, there we go. Next slide. This is just the catheter in the airway um, that we would choose. Um, hey, there are a variety. Here's a Cochrane systematic review, um, endobronchial radiation, and a couple other th uh, effects. The palliation of symptoms, 60 to 80%. Now, they say relieve of endobronchial obstruction. You have to be very cautious with this. Any form of radiation, and um, brachytherapy more so than other radiations, will lead to a lot of endobronchial edema. Um, the edema maximizes usually at 14 to 30 days 
Um, so ba um, bottom line is these patients will often, once they begin radiation, can get very short of um, breath if they've had a partial airway obstruction. Again, we work with our radiation oncologists. If there's over 50% airway obstruction or we're concerned of that, we actually look at it. We manage those airways very aggressively before because, again, we believe it allows our patients the best opportunity. Couple studies and complications are the radiation bronchitis. Bronchostenosis can occur from um, fistula formation and hemoptysis. Um, these couple slides on other techniques, I'm just going to go through very quickly. I wanna hit one last important point and we're almost to the time where we'd like to leave some time for questions. There's obviously balloon dilatation techniques which can be used. Um, we use fibrin glue, alloderm patches. Um, we've been very successful in starting to develop a technique for endobronchial grafting on patients for trachea on tracheoesophageal fistulas, particularly in stumpy histones, which are not are amenable to surgical repair, and bronchopleural fistulas, we've used it also. The point I wanted to get to is multimodality therapy. Um, you have to remember that um, you have a lot of different tools available to you, and very often you need a combination of these tools to do the treatments that you want. We just had a case the other day where we used a rigid bronchoscope, we did mechanical debulking, we used some cryotherapy, then we used electrocautery snare, um, and we were joking we should turn the laser on and shoot it just to say that we've used everything all at one, um, in one case. Um, but the bottom line was each of those tools was necessary for us to get to the low, um, a different location to be able to um, provide a different portion of treatment. This um, goes on, we, use, um, we see the tumor, we use a laser, we burn it, we photocoagulate the surface of that, um, we get a nice pretty picture of it, then we can use mechanical resection through a rigid, we take out the resected tumor, and then necessary, we will place a stent if we feel that um, it should be used, whether silastic and or metallic, depending on what the situation is, of course. This is another form of multimodality therapy. Here was a tumor endobronchially. We resected it endobronchially. Everything looked quite good, but um, we went ahead and did biopsies, and we had hints that there was still malignancy. Um, this was a non-surgical patient. They had already received radiation, so there wasn't a lot, of, um, lot more options for him at this point um, for his endobronchial disease. What we did was a central endobronchial ultrasound. Yes, there were people who still can do central ultrasound. And we identified that the tumor, um, the location was about 1.9 millimeters. So yes, there was still residual tumor, but it was outside of the, um, the submucosal layers completely. So we talked to the patient. We actually offered them photodynamic therapy. Um, we had follow-up bronchoscopy for two years following that without any signs of recurrent disease. Um, should this be the automatic way to go? No, this has to be discussed in a multidisciplinary forum um, where you get input from a variety of teams um, so that you can make all the um, best decisions. So on um, that note, a couple concluding um, remarks. Malignant area disease is complex, it includes obstruction, invasion, destruction. If you're going to use an endobronchial um, endoluminal treatment, you must understand what it is that's happening to your patient and what are the goals that you are trying to move towards. There's no one best technique. Um, I, I always have lived by the adage, he who dies with the most toys wins. And um, my program kind of demonstrates that because if there's something new, um, we obviously have to have it. Um, and, but that said, each of the tools, um, each of the tools that we use has different effects. Combination of tools can be of great benefit, a rigid, mechanical debulking tools, a thermal energy, a non-thermal energy, and different types of stents. Interventionalists must know the tools available to them. Don't start using laser unless you actually understand laser physics. Don't start using argon plasma unless you understand flow on the flow dynamics and the characteristics of what it is you're going to do. Um, yes, fluid, um, fluid dynamics are important, and you have to know how to use them most effectively. An interventionalist, you know the benefit, potential issues related to each tool and technique. So only add a tool when you understand the physics of it and the mechanical characteristics of it. Know it inside out, um, play with it. Now, when we get new tools, um, I'll actually sit in a lab and I will take a laser and I will cut on a variety of different tissues, changing settings, doing a variety of things to get to understand it. I've done that with electric pottery tools um, in the past and argon plasma, trying to understand them, then making cuts on the tissue, looking at under dissecting microscopes to get a better idea. 
Um, is that a bit obsessive? Yeah, it is a bit obsessive, but I think that is why I can choose each tool very carefully um, so that I have a better understanding of each, and I highly, highly recommend that to you. Um, we're at, we have about just over 10 minutes left, so I've covered a lot of material. Endoaluminal treatments are very important in our management, particularly of malignant disease. I tried to throw in one or two where we do use it for benign disease also. Um, I didn't cover granulation tissue um, or several other problems which can arise, but um, just because of a limitation of time. So if there are any questions, I see Russ has put up type questions here, and but I don't see any. Somehow I don't think it's because I was totally clear on everything. So again, anybody feel, please feel free to type questions for Dr. Simoff. Um, I wanna thank him for an, really an excellent talk. While we're waiting, um, I would like to ask, for a program that does not currently own a laser and is looking to purchase one, based on cost, usability, with all the different types, oh, yeah, yeah, what, um, do you have any suggestions on what, where to begin and what would probably be the most bang for your buck as far as purchasing a laser? I think that's a great question. Um, you know, when you're picking um, when you're picking a laser, I'll tell you what, the, most of the, the historically, the neomidium YAG has the most history. Um, they use the neomidium YAG in um, uh, obstetrics and gynecology as well as in urology. So that's one of the things that you have to kind of think about. If you're going to get one for your institution, you probably aren't going to be the big money maker. So go, um, you want to go to the other, your other, your colleagues in the other specialties to really get to know um, what they might want too. Because if you go as a group, um, you have a better chance of making the capital investment from the institution. Now, that being said, you also have to remember that lasers, particularly the big lasers, not the small diode lasers, um, are, are usually require a direct 220 line. So you actually have to have the environment which you can use on um, which you can use a laser also. The third component for choosing a laser is what are you going to use it for? Are you only using it for malignant disease or are you using it for combination of malignant benign? As you saw, we want to use, um, we use a laser for cutting um, occasionally in tracheal stenosis cases. Um, the characteristics of the laser for cutting like that is significantly different than on um, the laser for photocoagulation or photodesiccation. The energy delivery and the tissue response to that energy has to be different to maximize the effectiveness of each of them. So the first thing is if you're going to, um, if you're interested in getting to a laser, I would contact somebody who has one. I have one. The type of laser we currently have has a combination of holmium and neomidium YAG. Now, holmium is an interesting um, laser characteristic. Um, I like the manipulability of it. Um, we can make a lot of changes to it, much more than you can do with the neomidium YAG or the old KTP. I like the KTP lasers for cutting. You would say, well, why not use a CO2 laser for cutting? Well, the um, bottom line comes in is I'm um, going for a CO2 laser there is a flexible adapter which can go onto a CO2 laser that the ENTs have, but it is a direct fire laser. And I found no advantage because we we tested them side by side of using that versus a KTP. And I can say I see no effect of using um, the properly set up holmium laser to make that cut. Neomidium YAG isn't good for cutting, it's good for photocoagulation and photodesiccation. Um, so bottom line is I would ask some, but um, if you're going to buy one, um, I would tell you to go ahead and um, talk to somebody very, find out other people in your institution first, and then talk to an institution that uses it routinely. So do you have a choice of one laser over other for benign disease? I hope I answered that. It all has to do with wavelengths and energy delivery, because you have to have short, 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 short bursts of high energy for benign disease, because what you don't want to do is you don't want to stimulate the tissue that's around it, because all that does is take the fibroclasts and make um, turn them into fibroblasts. They have a um, big old party laying down collagen three in all sorts of places and lump it, um, get lumpy and bumpy and causes more destruction. Um, I have, would you open up an airway in someone with, an, um, not, with naive small cell lung cancer or wait until patient goes chemo radiation? Um, if the patient has, um, if the patient is symptomatic, if they're dis, um, if they're dysmic, yes, I will open up the airway. We can do it quickly and effectively. Um, the patient can then go on um, the very next day and get the radiation and chemo. 
um, we've actually taken people to the operating room and got radiation the same day. So um, it all depends on your location and um, the coordination that you can have with your medical and radiation oncologists. But I do believe that the patients do better if they have an airway obstruction um, to the um, to the, all of their treatments. Because if they have an 80% airway obstruction and you go ahead and you radiate that, um, then um, all they're going to do is be more short of breath. And then obviously they'll have the um, chance of less tolerance. I see neomedium EAG, we were having problems getting fibers for this. Do you have any such fibers getting it for your neomedium EAG? No, we don't have any problem getting fibers. You can email me and I can give you, um, there are about three different fibers on the market. We've tried, um, we've tried all of them and come down to um, a single fiber, which we stock in two different sizes. If you're gonna ask me which one off the top of my head, I'm gonna honestly say, I can't remember. <laughs> And okay, so, 654, um, I don't see any other questions. Do the moderators have any questions or anything I should touch base on? So I would just like to say that was an excellent, very uh, broad topic and inclusive. And we appreciate that you have um, put a lot of information beyond even what you just uh, said in the slides for people to view uh, later. Um, again, I see that your email is there for people who would like to potentially ask you questions individually. Um, again, thank you very much. And just before we finish, I just wanted to make a quick announcement for our next webinar, which will be um, in March. The date's still to be determined, but it will be with Dr. Gary Lee on complications of pleural infection. So, um, oh, we have one more question. Um, Could you comment on what APC settings. settings do you use and how many, how many they vary during a case? You know, quite honestly, with the APC, on the big settings, you're going to use 20, 30, or 40 watts. Think of it in those terms. The limitation in flow has all to do with um, the fiber that you're using. And most of the APC, on most of the APC fibers, are going to limit you to 0.5 liter per minute, or you can sometimes squeak it up to one liter per minute. You can't really change that because if you try to put it any higher than one liter per minute, um, what's going to happen is you're going to get back pressure and the, the system's going to keep beeping on you when wanting to turn off. So really, we keep it about 0.5 um, most of the time. Quite honestly, if I'm going to be using it for, um, if I'm using it for um, hemoptysis where I see a wall that's kind of bleeding, I'll use it about 30 watts. I believe that gives me about two, three millimeter depth of penetration. I can keep that, I can keep the airway wall dry and I can usually cause um, the, the photocoagulative effect that I'm looking for. If you go up to 40 watts, you're really gonna, you can potentially cause tissue destruction with that. You gotta remember, cause you're still heating up the tissue on um, the endobronchial fluid warm up quite a bit. Um, so usually 30 to um, usually 30 watts if um, it's just something that's oozing. 40 watts, I'll go up to that. 20 watts, a lot of people talk about, but I don't find that it gets a deep enough penetration on a wall, even for um, that initial coagulative effect that I had just mentioned. Hopefully that answered it. Um, comment. Um, Risk of fire of laser with other materials oh. in the airways. And stuff. That's an interesting question. Do laser, um, do stents burn? Um, I tried to burn them um, and they really don't burn all that well. Um, if you take a, um, we actually put it right on a, um, right on a table. We took a, a silicone stent and we had oxygen running on it. And I took the laser at high energy and I fired it at the wall and the wall turned white, but the energy was actually um, magnified and shot over to the opposite wall. It heated it up and destroyed it, but I could not make the thing start on fire. Um, in terms of covered stents, usually they will shrivel up and not burn. And um, when you get the material, when you get the material that it kind of shrivels, it again doesn't start on fire. And most of the effect gets is if when you heat up a wire, all those wires will heat up quickly and they will fracture, um, and they will fracture, which can actually cause even more problems for you. I don't recommend doing it in the airways, but also um, I now will use thermal energy like a laser around a stent much more readily than I may have in the past. Hopefully that answers it. So I have one last question for you. Shoot. Um, you mentioned you mentioned that that although people say six to eight weeks to essentially salvage an obstruction, I know other people, Dr. Meta said four. Are there what are the what are the signs radiographically or or otherwise that make you 
think that something is potentially salvageable when it's been obstructed for a long period of time? It's a tough question. What we actually sit down and we do is we'll, um, we'll look at patients. First off, you'll look at the big picture on a patient. What, um, what is the situation? On um, What is the situation? How dysmic? What are the advantages you would get if you could get the airway open? And things along those lines. So it's um, first off a thought process. Number two, why doesn't, um, um, the question shouldn't be of why do, you know, what is the time frame that you use to stop? The question should be why does that happen? And the happen, what happens? Well, you, you obstruct an airway. And once an airway is obstructed, you um, eventually, um, there's no airflow. So when there's no airflow, the body's pretty smart. And what it does is it begins to shift blood flow over. So the blood flow will then shift to the right. So you're maximizing your BQ relationship, right? So the tricky part of all of this is thinking in terms, um, in thinking in terms of what is happening inside that chest. Now, if I have somebody with a collapsed lung, 40%, they're dysmic when they come to see, um, see me. We can't treat their tumor because the lung is obstructed, obviously, um, because we don't know what the extensions are or anything. So what we um, often will do is we'll, uh, I actually have done, and we've never published this data, but we do perfusion studies on these patients. And we take a, um, we take a look to see how much perfusion actually is occurring in the lung, which is collapsed. And if it's above 10%, that's implicative. Um, that's actually implicative that the lung is actively still being perfused. Um, on those patients, it isn't uncommon for us to go ahead and try, attempt opening it. Now, it's an interesting scenario. When you take somebody with a narrow thing, um, a narrowed or closed airway, and you open it, you can ventilate that lung almost immediately. Um, in 24 to 48 hours, you will already be having airways opened. The tricky part comes in is that if those patients then become, um, start ventilating that lung without perfusing it, you can make them more hypoxic. And that hypoxic episode can last for about 48 to 72 hours. But after that, quite often it will open. It's a very tricky area. Nobody's really understood, um, and, and nobody's stated it, but the numbers have come from experience. And um, it's not that we've sat down and we've actually done the physiology in terms of looking at the pathophysiologic implications of what happens when a lung collapses. I've um, we've attempted doing that. We've been doing ventilation perfusion. We're looking at um, several other parameters to see if we can open that up. But it's truly a clinical de um, it's truly a clinical decision. Some of it comes from the fact that if you really do believe that the patient is going to get some benefit and they do have enough perfusion there already, there's no reason that they shouldn't uh, their perfusion shouldn't return. Remember, the perfusion left because the lung collapsed. Um, which means that the autonomic mechanisms were needed. If you have a lung that's collapsed and the perfusion is exactly what it was before, um, there is already an autonomic um, difficulty and that person's gonna be significantly hypoxic as it is right off the bat. So understanding why the lung collapsed and then secondarily understanding um, what is happening behind that, I, I really do believe can make a big difference. We've opened up airways um, that have been closed for significant periods of time. You can take this over to benign disease and Wegner's and in tuberculosis. Tuberculosis has a tendency to cause these nasty, nasty um, uh, bronchial uh, main stem uh, stenoses, and um, patients are extremely dysmic. Same thing happens in tuberculosis that cause main stem. These are predominant uh, more in the Asian populations and in Asia itself. And what I've noticed is that if you actually do ventilation perfusion studies on those patients, you will already have seen diminished perfusion. It's, um, so that's kind of where the, um, my interest in the physiology gets started. And then once we noted that once, when we opened those areas, we could return the perfusion, it started to make sense that if the autonomic functions are still there, if there is normal lung still available, which in almost all of these cases, there is normal lung available, what is to stop the perfusion from returning? So we'll have discussions with patients. And um, I don't believe that it's a time frame anymore. I don't look at the number. I look at the patient and I look at the disease that's going on. Um, and we make a decision based on that. Okay. All right. Well, Hopefully I think that we've hit our time, our time limit. Again, thank you very much, Dr. Simoff. And um, I think at this time, we're, uh, we will sign off if we have no other questions. Thank well, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I appreciate everybody who was here tonight. And if there are any questions, you have my contact information. Good night, everybody. Good night.